for isolated areas. Reducing child and maternal mortality through food safety, prenatal education and clean water conditions. Studying and documenting local systems of health care delivery and identifying what progress has been made, what challenges remain. And lastly, using the latest communication technologies to bring this specialist knowledge to the developing world. I've summarised that. All volunteers, they are a focal team. Again, this is a Cayuca, this is their primary mode of transportation. So living in these communities, to get to any health care, you have to travel in a Cayuca similar to one of these for anywhere up to uh, an hour, two hours, maybe three hours. These boats are very unstable. So since I've been there with the floating doctors in Panama, which is about three months, I've heard of two families, the entirety of the family drowned in rough seas trying to get from their community to one of the hubs which has a hospital or provisions um, or anything that a city or a relatively small town would offer you. If you are a coastal community, you have the luxury of having one of these unstable boats. But even before you get into the boat, you might have to travel along this excessively muddy trail just to get to that form of transportation to get to your hospital. This photograph was taken on our way up to prison, uh, to a mobile clinic that we did in a community. It took us four hours of hiking through something similar to this after a two hour boat ride. Um, we were fortunate because it didn't rain that day, but if it has rained that day or the day before, the rivers, which this community had three, um, can often become impassable. So if you again can imagine yourself in one of these communities and needing any sort of emergency care, you're not going to get it. Uh, I skipped real quickly past the first one, but this is a man who was attacked by a monkey, <laughs> which does happen in these remote places. Um, they have other wild animals as well. He, both of his legs and both of his arms were uh, deeply wounded. You might have a condition similar to these women, which is just pregnancy. They have many children. Um, these are young women. They're about anywhere from 15 to 17 out of the four here. They have usually around 8 to 10 children within their family. Um, these women don't receive any prenatal care. So they don't know if their children are healthy until the day of birth. 
So these are the people that the floating doctors are trying to focus on. They're not trying to replace the hospital systems that are there. Um, they're trying to be a support. The, the communities that I just showed you are communities that these people can't get to the health care that they need. So the floating doctors goes to the communities. The original team, um, this is them here, and on the far left there, or I guess on your far, <laughs> on your right, is going to be uh, Dr. Ben Lebro. He's the founder of the organization, and their original mission was different than it is now. They set out to visit different communities, spend a few weeks there, two or three weeks, treating patients um, that they could, and then moving on to the next destination. What they soon realized, though, is that that works for some. Uh, this young child had a cold or a flu, so you can treat that one off. Um, there's minor surgeries that you can have. Uh, one of the pictures that I unfortunately skipped through too quickly was a child that had 72 warts on his hand, which is not only painful, but makes it difficult for him to use that hand. Um, we can operate on him. Um, we can give this child some cold medications, and there's other other uh, things that we can do to help people on one-off treatment. But there's also more in the community. Some people need lasting care. Some people need um, more than that one-off treatment. This man had elephantitis of the leg. For him to have better quality of life than what he currently has, he needs constant care, constant drainage. Um, that's not, we're not helpful if we go in for two, three weeks and then, <laughs> see so yeah, we've got another place to go. So what the floating doctors did is after uh, about a year and a half of delivering care in that fashion, in places like Haiti, um, the Cayman Islands, they stopped, reflected, and realized that in order for them to provide health care, sustainable health care in communities, that they need to do more than travel to different locations that they felt needed aid or who were asking for aid. They needed to create permanent presence in each of those locations. So that's what they did. This is the Southern Wind. This is the boat that they take um, wherever they go. It has transported them over 5,000 miles thus far. Um, but in each location now, and now we're working in Panama, they drop anchor, they integrate into the community, and uh, set up what's going to be permanent clinics in each one of those locations. The goal is to have multiple permanent clinics and for the boat then to deliver volunteers and medical supplies between the clinics. Um, as well as then venturing out to more remote locations to find more people that we can service. Um, so with our permanent clinics, there's a number of things that we offer as a service. The primary one is the mobile clinics, and this is where we take the medicines and the doctors and whatever we can to the people so that they don't have to find some way to get through the mud and through the boat systems to get to the hospital. Uh, as you can see, Ben is holding a bag, and that's full of medications. We load medications and volunteers into smaller boats, and we use those smaller boats to then venture into the communities. Once we're in the communities, we set up a clinic, however we can. We had a shelter provided for us in this location. Oftentimes we try to coordinate having a school available to us or a community center. Sometimes we don't get that luxury and we just sort of have to make do with what we've got. Um, in the clinics, we set up as many doctors as we can. Again, it depends on how many volunteers we have with us. Oftentimes we have one doctor and we can have up to three. Um, we had 20 UCLA nurses down last month, um, so at that point we were able to see a lot more patients. Um, we do health checks on the children in all of the schools that we visit, and if we see that there's any ill health, we then, uh, this volunteer is checking for ill health and then she would take them to the doctor to be seen um, if they find anything. We have a portable ultrasound which is an, obviously a novelty to a lot of these people without electricity and that. Um, so these women are receiving prenatal care for the first time. 
We allow them to view their babies, to offer advice on the health of their babies, and we also can give them prenatal vitamins, which to help them through their pregnancies. Uh, one of our main goals is education, and the doctors do education throughout their consultations. That's one of our primary um, goals, is to make sure that patients aren't just treated, but they're educated as to why they have a particular condition and, and what they can do to change that, if necessary. We take that health education also outside of the clinic. So we go into the schools in the communities. This volunteer here is handing out toothbrushes and uh, showing them how to brush teeth. Most don't brush teeth, never have. <laughs> it doesn't even occur to them to do so. Um, so a health education like this, very simple, can go a long way. Um, we also find that there's oftentimes a gap in the training, even in the professional um, operations. This is a firefighting service over in, um, I think this was in Honduras. They did not have basic first aid training. So again, we just work with them. We find a need in the community and see what we can do to uh, help build health there. These are some local residents in Bocas del Toro, Panama. And this is what we would consider a nursing home, an aged care facility. Many of them have not been outside of this facility for years. So we decided to help them with that quality of life, and we go two times a week to push them around in the streets, take them shopping if they want it, buy them a juice. Um, just allow them to get outside of the confined walls that they've lived in. Not that they don't have good nursing care, but they don't have any um, quality of life care. <laughs> We also <clears throat> integrate into the community with different partnerships. This is Operation Safe Drinking Water. The blue tanks you see are um, installed into communities so that communities can have clean water, which is, again, a new thing for a lot of the communities that we see. We partner with them by helping to transport the um, tanks to the communities, and then while Operation Safe Water is installing the tanks, will offer a clinic to the communities and offer treatment to whoever needs it. Um, with community projects, we also go into cleaning up the community in any way that it needs. Um, this nursing home in the back had just piles of uh, rubbish, and so we help them to get rid of that. We've been painting schools, and in doing so, uh, recruiting the, the young um, Panamanians to help us do the work. So they're being introduced to volunteerism, which is a novelty down there. <coughs> they're also given skills that hopefully they can use later in life. Um, one, we have, we have many projects, but this one is just one highlight that I'll um, go into the story of. This is Wendy. She has cerebral palsy and is bound to a wheelchair. This is where she lives. Um, back here, in the back, there behind all the other houses is where she lives. That's her house. And this walkway here is how you get to her house. So if you could imagine having a child with a wheelchair, she has no way of leaving her house, no way of going to school at the moment. And a society that doesn't know how to um, deal with things like cerebral palsy, it scares them a bit. So. We've helped them um, build a walkway that allows her to now leave her house for the first time in five years. And we're starting to work with this education system to integrate her back into school so that she can um, be educated at the age of 14. So that's just a snippet of what the Floating Doctors does. Um, again, 20 minutes can't really do the organization justice. Um, as was mentioned before, we are involved in research projects, collection of data, and a lot of other things that um, I'd love for you to look into if you're interested further in the floating doctors. What I'm doing currently here in Australia, one is coming home to pack up all my things so I can be permanently in Panama with them for a while, but also recruiting um, specific volunteers. We have many doctors and nurses coming through, but every day we see kids or adults that have dental problems, and the only thing we can do is give them medicine for pain. <laughs> we have no other treatment for them at this point, so we desperately need dentists. 
Um, the other thing that we're looking for is optometrists. Again, we've got buckets full of lenses that have been donated to us, and the only way to get them on someone's face and hopefully helping them is by sitting down for over an hour or two hours trying one lens on at a time, saying, is that better, is that better, is that better? Um, so it would be a lot easier if we had an optometrist there to let us know what the uh, prescription is, and then we could fish out the lens and give it to them. We also are faced with a lot of um, elderly with cataracts and losing their eyesight. So dentists and optometrists are the main goals for my visit here to Australia. Um, to assist with our optometrists, we're looking for a portable auto refractor, which is um, what the optometrists use to measure your uh, prescription. Um, and as will always be the same with any nonprofit, we are looking for volunteers, we're looking for donations. Um, back on the volunteers, I'll back up just a bit. We don't just need medical professionals. Um, we've got anybody, on, we've, we have many people on the boat right now that have absolutely no medical experience whatsoever. Um, they have big hearts and they have some time that they're willing to give. And they can be just as valuable. Um, we're looking for any way of getting our message out to friends and family and getting a bit of publicity sponsorships, um, medical supplies, and equipment that we can use for our mobile clinics and the construction of our permanent clinics. Uh, this is where you can go to get some more information. The website, Floating Doctors, um, Gmail address, floatingdoctors at Gmail for any communication and any questions that you have. Um, and we do have, we're lucky to have a documentary crew, a, a volunteer crew that's come down to help us um, put together some videos that will encourage um, participation, volunteers, um, and there are some there's some brilliant and beautiful videos that really illustrate the work that we do and how we affect the communities and the individuals in the locations that we visit. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for your time and for having me. Lisa, I will ask the first question. Sure. We noticed that Fred, a Rotarian, was included in one of your pictures. What has come from Rotary? What is happening with Rotary that you know of at the moment with the floating doctors? Um, good question. I won't be able to give you a full answer on that. I know that in the past, Rotary has was involved with the delivery of medical supplies. Um, I don't believe that that's an ongoing relationship. Um, I, that, but yeah, that's as much as I can give you really, that there's, there was uh, involvement, I believe it was specific to Haiti, and it was where every club that was involved with the Haiti effort. Yeah. Questions, please. Gavin. If someone's to volunteer to go over there, do you pay the fees over? What, what sort of period of time? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to say yes, because that would mean my airfares were covered as well. Uh, no. Anybody who, that's actually, it's one of our ways of um, being able to cover our operating costs, is volunteers that come down not only have to find their way down, but then they give a volunteer contribution, which covers their um, their food while they're down there, helps us buy fuel to visit the communities. So, unfortunately, no. David. Lisa, why Panama? Why not uh, Vanuatu or some other place? They've got a variety, they've been to a variety of places. So they've been, they started off in Haiti, went to the Capetian Islands. Um, they've been back to Haiti. They, they left before the earthquake happened and down to Jamaica. Um, so they've, they've chosen places either that people have reached out to them and said, we think that this would be a really good place for you just to um, provide care. Um, or ones that on a map were a logical flow from one place to another. Because again, with, with having the boat as your um, transportation, uh, you need to have sort of a route that you're going to take and then strategic places along the way. Um, it, it is a good question because I think a lot of people look at Panama and think of it as more of a wealthy country, um, which part of it is. However, there's a lot, uh, as some of the pictures would show, that the, the care just isn't reaching out to the certain population. Uh, just a question. 
And the first one, when you're doing an ultrasound, or they're doing an ultrasound there, uh, what happens if they found there's something, say, wrong with the child in the utero? Would they form an abortion, or uh, what actually happens uh, with something like that? And also, the second question is, do they have any religious affiliation with people with the behind this? Um, I'll answer the first, the, the latter part of your question first because it's the easiest. No, there's no religious affiliations and they've um, sort of tried to bend that way so that it's, it's really just about the mission and not so much about trying to um, make sure that we're navigating the religions appropriately for the different cultures that we're in um, or any of the different partnerships that, that we're striving to um, partner with. Uh, this, the first part of your question about the ultrasounding, that goes into anything that we do, any other surgeries or any treatment that we give. We, we look at and analyze the situation and determine a best course of action. It may be that we try to get them to a hospital um, to, for, to do an abortion or to further something. We, we'll go as far as we, at that point in time, can go in, in terms of treatment. Um, so sometimes if we just have a general practitioner that doesn't have the experience in that say an abortion, we wouldn't try that sort of a treatment or course of action. If we did have a specialist with us who was confident in that line of action and had what they needed to um, safely fulfill that, then we would go that route. So oh, this also, with eight children, is it, are they doing in relation to birth control? The, what we're using in, to tackle that problem at this point is just education. Um, we haven't gone to the form of distributing birth control because that starts a whole nother, that, that's a whole nother can of worms. Um, and you have to have birth control to continually give. Um, so it's, that one we're navigating through just education at the moment. Pam. Do they have their own traditional medicines as well that they use? Yes, yes they do, and we have been working with, they're called Cunanderos. Um, we've met with the local Cunandero a, a few times now, trying to find how we can um, lessen, let's say, the, the, the pharmaceutical impact and utilize what resources they have available to them on a daily basis. Um, so we've gone with him a few times. He's sort of pointed out the different um, things that you can use uh, as natural medicines. Um, and we've done some tests, and those are some of the things that we've, we've already done some um, sampling and have sent them to laboratories so that we can even start to figure out well, what is about this plant that works. Um, and then we use whatever we learn from him in our consultations and, oh, you know, this is one thing that you can do to try to lessen the rash or whatever it is. So we're definitely interested in, uh, it's, not, it's not just focused on Western medicine. Um, it, there's, or, the whole organization is open to any form of treatment and what's going to be best for the patient that we're seeing at the time. Any further questions? Yes, Barbara. Are donations tax deductible? Yes. <laughs> 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 if a patient's case is is not uh, cannot be handled by floating doctor or local facilities, but it's simple enough that you know that in some developed countries would be quite easily available in terms of help. What would the floating doctor do in those circumstances? So looking for international interventions. Yes. Is that what your question yes. is? Um, we have had that in terms of, we've had a man with um, a, an arm that was broken in multiple places, but then he continued life, as you do with a broken arm. Um, so it healed, in, so he has multiple hinges. Um, there was no uh, medical aid within his country that was able to facilitate. Um, so we've just been trying to contact um, doctors that were either in our own network and we've posted things online, just trying to see if we can um, get some interest or somebody who knows how to deal or will be able to go and reset his arm. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know if there would be, let's say, a procedure in, in tact yes. to say when this happens, this is what we do. Um, but there is a, there's, there's a follow through with all of the patients. Um, 
local and international. So they're still in communication with patients that they had in the other countries that they visited, as well as, or, you know, we're dealing with a, a Panamanian right now. He was the very first man to come to us asking for help. He had a hernia and um, was having trouble getting the, the operation through the hospital. They keep turning him away. And it's taken us six months now with doctors go, going in with him and being real forceful about pushing him through the system. So yes, we're, we're willing to take the individual cases and keep going until we find resolve with it. Thanks. Kate, with, with the clinics they're setting up and they're trying to set them up to come to clinics, are they, are they doing anything with technology where you're looking at webcams, like solar powered webcams and laptops so that they can continue to see people and interact with people? Yes, one of our um, sort of exciting things that we're trying to get going is for, for that very reason, but also so that we can, let's say, go to a mobile clinic and have someone in New York with uh, an expertise in a specific area offering advice. Or, so in, instead of going to a doctor and saying, oh, can you spend $3,000 to come join us for you know, two months, um, we're able to say, do you mind just giving us a half an hour of your time every month? So yes, this, we're trying to use technology to um, allow volunteerism to be an easier option, as well as to keep communications between the clinics as well, so we can have our you know founding doctor in one place, but he's still treating patients in others. There are Australian branch of the proving doctors, or um, not, where is it based? It, it's based out of LA. Um, that was when they, they started. It's, it's still a small organization. It, they launched the boat um, basically two years ago. Um, so I, you're sort of looking at the Australian branch <laughs> at the moment. No, no one, of, one of my goals while I am here is to begin the process of establishing it as a nonprofit here in Australia. Sorry, I'm not challenging you. Yeah. Margaret's question, you said that uh, it is tax deductible. Unless you get that sorted out, it won't be tax deductible in Australia. Yes, sorry, I, I sometimes forget where I am. I was just in the States for a month. So yes, for Australians it wouldn't be, for the for States goers, yes. Thank you for bringing that up, that's an important point. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Please take it here. Okay. Uh, Rob Walker.